Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Colonial Heights United Methodist Church. I have great and awesome news. Have you all heard that Dolly Parton is making a movie about surviving the pandemic in East Tennessee? She is. She is going to make a movie. And the greatest thing is we all know how Dolly is so generous. She's into reading. She gives books to kids. She gives back to the community all the time. So when she does this movie, she's not going to profit off of the pandemic. That's not, that's not her style. No, she's going to hire everybody that wants to be in the movie for $10,000. No matter if you have a walk-on part or if you get a lead role, you get $10,000. Yes, amen, and we all love Dolly. I'm in line. How about you? I'm there. I'm there. This is the way it is in the kingdom of heaven. We're glad that you've joined us for worship, and we invite you today to open your minds and your hearts as we continue to explore what it's like to live in the kingdom of heaven here and now. Dark 
darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anger holds within. Scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of Matthew. I'll be reading in the 20th chapter, verses 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual day's wage, he sent them out into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others still standing in the marketplace, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each one of them received the usual day's wage, a denarius. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual day's wage, a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only an hour, and you gave them equal to us. You have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual day's wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the word of God for the children of God. Let us pray. 
God, open our hearts and our minds that we might find ourselves in this story. Give us the courage to face who we are inside. As David said, search and try us, O Lord. Make us pure in your mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Did anybody at all get upset that Dolly Parton was going to pay everybody $10,000? Nobody got upset. Didn't bother me at all. But this parable is going to be the death of me. Doesn't this make you mad? Would you go to work at 6 o'clock in the morning for the same thing, get paid the same as the guy that shows up at 5? What's fair about that? This story troubles me. What is fair about this parable? And yet, sweet Dolly and her generosity doing what's right for the community doesn't upset anybody. You see, this happened on a regular basis. The laborers would gather in the market and wait to be hired. Now, servants were actually better off if you were a slave or a servant because you knew how you were going to be fed. You knew that you were working in the household on the landowner's land, and you knew that you'd get paid. Your family could eat. But those laborers who were not servants already had to be hired. Now, what is the law of human nature? We're going to hire the big, strong, strapping folks first, right? If you're plowing a field, if you're harvesting grapes... You want the best that's available. So they got hired first. And then as the day went through, they needed more laborers. And so they would go out and hire more. And each time, the pickings would be slim, as they say. So by the end of the day, it's the elderly. It's those who really aren't capable, maybe, of working as hard. Those that are overlooked less respected on the late vineyard field. And yet this outrageous landowner chooses to pay them the exact same as the others. Everyone has enough, but no one has too much. Is this the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says it is. Is this the kingdom we honestly want to live in? It's like manna in the wilderness with the Hebrew slaves that left Egypt, where it's the land of domination versus submission, the land of the rich versus the poor, the power versus the powerless, the haves and the have-nots. And they are now out in the wilderness, and God is creating a new people, and he gives them manna, their daily bread to eat. Moses got the same as the littlest fella walking at the end of the line. Everybody had enough, but no one had too much. And in fact, if you tried to store it up, it would rot and smell, and everybody in camp would know that you were cheating the system, God's system, where everybody has enough and no one has too much. Once again, we need to look at more of Matthew's story. What's been going on before Jesus tells this parable? In fact, before he even starts the parable, he says, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And it all started, you remember the story of the rich young ruler who has everything? He has life by the horns. He is a big strapping young fellow on his way up the corporate ladder. He's got it all. And he has followed the law of Jesus. He's kept all the commandments. He goes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, what must I do to live in the kingdom of God? And what is it that Jesus says to him? You've done everything except one thing. Go and sell everything you've got and give the money to the poor. And we watch as this young man walks away from Jesus. And we have assumed that he is doing it because he cannot give up his material goods. 
And I will tell you, I was in the middle of preaching on that passage, and as I was talking, the Holy Spirit put in my heart, that is not the issue at hand. Because Jesus says, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. The reason that rich young ruler walked away from the kingdom of God is not because he wanted to keep his material goods, because he could not stand the idea of giving everything he owns to those people. To those people who did not deserve it. The poor had done nothing. And he had worked hard for his money. Even if he'd gotten it as an inheritance, it came with a weight and a burden. And it was, they had done nothing. That's why he walks away from the kingdom. And then in the next part of that story, Peter, here goes Peter again. I'm telling you, if the disciples had just shut Peter up, we'd all been better off. Peter says, what about us, God? What about us, Jesus? We've walked away from everything. We've walked away from our families. We've given up everything for the kingdom of God. And then Jesus goes on to tell him that they will rule over in the restored kingdom, that they will be rulers and they will have things and be restored a hundredfold. But then he adds at the very end of his answer to Peter, but many who are first will be last and the last will be first. And then he tells this parable about, for the kingdom of heaven is like is like this God who is generous enough to give everyone enough and no one has too much. Did you catch in today's reading what the chief complaint of those first hired workers were? It really wasn't the denarius. They had agreed to work for a denarius. But when they go to the landowner, they say, you have made them equal to us. You have made those weak, insignificant, chosen last people equal to the strong and the mighty who are able to work. You have made them equal to us. Do you understand? The kingdom of heaven is like this. There is no hierarchy. There is no corporate ladder. There is no rich versus poor. There is no in and out. There is no power versus powerless. There is no haves and haves not. Jesus and Paul and Peter have said, there is neither Jew nor Greek, male or female, slave or free in the kingdom. I think Jesus, in his original telling of this parable, was speaking to the Pharisees, as he usually did, because the Pharisees had kept the covenant. They had kept their agreement with God. They were obedient to the letter of the law. And now they're watching this Jesus welcome tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes, of all things, into the kingdom of heaven. You have made them equal to us? Matthew, in his preaching, reuses Jesus' parable most likely for the Jewish Christians in his midst and the Gentile Christians in his midst, saying, you have made them equal to us? Or maybe he's speaking to longtime Christians that have been in the church since its founding. Maybe those people walked with Jesus, and Matthew is saying to them, hey, guys, we all get the same thing. We all get the same thing. And they're saying, wait a minute, we've been here since the beginning. Maybe he's saying it to older folk when younger folk come in and start taking over in the church and start doing new things. And Matthew is saying to them, hey, everybody gets the same. One isn't ranked higher in the kingdom than another. 
Maybe it's those who've been a Christian since birth, since the crib. They were born on the back pew of the church. And they're saying, wait a minute, you mean to tell me that somebody can be on their deathbed and get in, squeak into, that's what I used to hear, used to squeak under the door into heaven, just slide their way right in. That's not fair. You see, throughout history, Throughout human history, there has always been an us versus them. You remember Jonah. He's the guy that got swallowed in a whale. He would have rather been in the belly of the whale than to go to Nineveh because he knew that God was gracious. And those Ninevites, you are going to make those Ninevites equal to me. Me who've been in exile, me who served you faithfully, you're going to take those Ninevites and make them equal to us. You see, the parable tells us the very nature of God from the beginning of time is that all means all, and we are all equal in the kingdom of God. The question is, and this parable raises more questions than it gives answers. The question is, why were we not upset with Dolly when she was going to give us $10,000? Why are we mad about the landowner and the day's wage? What is it within us that has to be better than, superior, in some way recognized more than others? Or at least as much. Yeah, this parable drives me crazy. It's like the prodigal son. I think this parable, pretty much you could just read it and know what else is in the Bible through and through because it's the parable of the prodigal in Luke where you know the story. The younger brother goes out, he gets his inheritance, he goes out and blows it, having a good time. He comes home, crying home to daddy, and daddy welcomes him with open arms. The elder brother is working out in the field and says, I am not going into that party. Uh Uh-uh, that son of yours? No, I have worked and been faithful to you my whole life. And you're going to let that scallywag squeeze under the door and come in? It's the same story. It's the same story. And we get angry at the generous landowner. We get mad at the father welcoming the home, hump son home. And we would rather be in the belly of a whale than to have those Ninevites equal to us. Maybe that's why we haven't experienced more of the kingdom of heaven here and now. It's because of this parable. Because we know, if we're honest, we know that God is going to make all of them like all of us. And the question is, who is them and who is us? You see, it changes for each generation, for each generation person the them versus us may be different but we have to ask ourselves really hard honest questions would we live in a country where everybody who went to work made the same thing where everybody had enough but no one had too much do we really want to live someplace where everyone who wants to work can and all make the same thing? Do we really want to be rewarded for what we do? Don't we really want to be better than? Don't we really like the hierarchy depending on where we are? So how does the landowner respond? He says, do you, are you envious because I am generous? And in the Greek language, the actual expression is, do you have an evil eye because I am good? To have an evil eye is more than just jealousy. It's to look upon the person with contempt. Do we actually have contempt in our heart for this landowner who is God because he treats everyone the same? How dare him make them like us.
and the questions get harder. Who is your them and who is your us? Will you be like the first hired and come complain and grumble to God? Will you be the elder son that refuses to go into the party because those people are there? Will you be resentful because in the kingdom of God it is not debatable? All are equal. All are the same. All are loved and cherished. For those of us who have based our entire lives on earning our way, pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps, this parable ticks us off. It just goes right into the gut and says, wait a minute. It's hard. It's challenging. One of my favorite events in life happened at annual conference, so if I've shared it, I'm going to share it again because it's, it, I love it. We were discussing immigration laws in the United States and how you respond as a Christian to immigration. How would Jesus have us to respond as a church to immigrants coming in with their children into our country? And there was a man that stood up in front of the entire annual conference at Stewart Auditorium that holds 1,200 people mustered up his courage, went to the microphone, got called on by the bishop and said, but we can't. I used to work in the government. We cannot let just anybody in. We can't just let anybody in. It's an issue of national security. I know what Jesus would do, but... And you could have heard a pin drop not because people were ashamed of what the man said, but because of the shame within them, because we all know it's true. At some point, on some issue, at some place, there is a them versus us, and we know what Jesus would do, but we cannot make ourselves do it, and we would rather be in the whale than to have God make us equal to them. It's the yeah, but. We know what Jesus would do. We know what Jesus meant, but yeah, yeah, but. There is good news in this parable. Has anybody ever been at the end of the line? The, you know, the one last picked. Oh, dear Lord in heaven, I can, I can still get sick to my stomach at the thought of being in the third grade in elementary school. And instead of the teacher dividing us up, you know, blondes versus brunettes or tall versus short or whatever, no, 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 no. She picked two leaders, and what did she do? She let those teacher, she let the two kid leaders pick their teams for baseball. And let me tell you, I actually hit myself in the eye with the baseball when I was up to bat. I have no coordination at sports. I was not the last pick, praise be to God, but I sure was not ever the first. And that follows you. You know, that stuff follows you into middle school. It follows you for, throughout life sometimes. We have countless people who've gone to college, who've earned their degree, who are fighting to get a chance. And they're at the end of the line. If you've ever been at the end of the line, if you know the shame to have that hierarchy pulled on you, if you've been passed over by a promotion because you're not tall enough or not smart enough or not cute enough or whatever, this is good news. When we live in the kingdom, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, and the sinners are as welcomed as the Pharisees. All are the same. All are the same.
the kingdom of heaven is like a place where everyone has enough. No one has more than enough. And all are cherished and loved. We get to decide if that's good news or not. The choice to live in the kingdom or not is ours. Amen. time we know exactly what you would do but yeah it's just a yeah but we ask your forgiveness show us this week throughout our days who the them are help us to love to cherish and to be grateful for the gift of your grace bestowed on all in Jesus name Amen. May you go in the peace and the knowledge that you are a beloved child of God. Amen.